So it's taken about um, 26 minutes to get our <laughs> hangout version two going. It's okay though. We've got our technical difficulties we're, fixed. Oh, we're <laughs> old. What can you, what, I mean, Susie's in the sound booth. We're all ready. 30 now. minutes okay. to connect ain't bad, right? Oh, welcome, gosh. Welcome to the show, guys. We have Preston, James, Susie back with us by popular demand. Our first macro Bitcoin hangout was very popular. We have a special guest that's going to come in like Peter did last time. Uh, so you'll have Who to stay tuned be? for the whole show. Uh, but how are you guys? Great to see you. Good to see you. What's new? Yeah, doing great. What's everyone up to? And nothing Summer. going on. There's Summer is in full on. swing. I, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but Preston and the beard, man, it is oh. solid. Yes. It's solid. Thank you, sir. It Thank you. I am a big fan. Yep. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and bearded Thank Preston you. is just a completely different person than not very different person. person. This is very <laughs> true, and it's coming in the right color too. You know, mm -hmm. people so. learned this in Bedford. Yes, so I had a neck tattoo for two uh, day and a half or whatever it was. It happens. We, we saw what happens in Bedford. In, yeah, we saw sides of you in Bedford. We did not know existed, which was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I've kept all the receipts, so in, in oh case, boy, yeah. Oh boy, watch out. If Preston ever wrongs me, I'll be releasing that to Twitter. <laughs> or X, I guess. He doesn't have to wrong you to release it. Come on. Everything has a oh. price, Susie. Everything has a price. I'm excited for us all to reunite very soon. Bitcoin Nashville's just around the corner. Make sure to get your ticket. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's so much happening right now. I mean, Bitcoin's price is still not not doing anything crazy, but um, but I feel like now. Bitcoin is front and center with the election of all things. Like, what do you guys think about Trump coming out and being for Bitcoin? Satan was ac actually hilarious that all Bitcoin mining in, in the United States, was it even really, a, yeah, was it really funny. a tweet? Was it, have we, yeah, have we yeah, it was. That yeah. really was. And did he yeah. delete it later or something? Like, I, okay. <laughs> no, uh, I, I thought I saw that. Well, yeah, get your American made Bitcoin, right? It's of course, it'll never <laughs> happen, but okay, well, hey, it, it's the right direction. It's I mean, right if anything, it, it's incentivizing more decentralization because if people would actually take the comment seriously, then they're like incentivized to mine it in their country. So, you know, I, I don't care. You know, for me, when I saw that he was coming out very pro Bitcoin, I think David Bailey's uh, heavily behind a lot of the, the stuff mm -hmm. that's happening, obviously, but, uh, you know, um, hey, as many politicians that want to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon, welcome. Uh, I, I'm very happy about that. Uh, I, I wish both sides would be fighting over Bitcoin and saying they're more Bitcoin than just one side. But uh, whatever, you know, like have at it. Yeah, I think they'll be competing for who likes Bitcoin more. And it's funny because after he shared that post, I think it was on Truth Social, Biden's campaign suddenly accepted crypto for donations. Yeah, mm. while they're trying, they're trying to kill it, but they'll they'll accept it. Yeah, you know? but yeah. it's going to be interesting. I think it's just going to pick up steam. They're going to talk about it on the on the debates if we even get to a debate stage. Um, did you did you see Balaji's comment? Uh, and I think he posted this a couple, maybe a couple weeks ago or something. That it was a orange versus green uh, election, oh. meaning it's a Bitcoin versus U.S. dollar election. He said that. Oh no, I didn't see that. Yeah, I yeah. didn't either. Which I thought was an interesting comment. Oh, yeah, we're, seeing, actually, yeah. we're seeing that kind of play out based on the Democrats kind of aligning with dollar policy and just being really kind of uh, anti anything crypto, Bitcoin, and uh, the Republicans kind of doing the opposite. Kennedy keeps definitely tweeting about Bitcoin too. So I think yeah, it, yeah, it's an interesting change that we're seeing. Well, what's yeah. the what's the stat, Natalie? How many people in America own crypto? I mean, not just Bitcoin, but crypto. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a sizable number, right? It's like fifty million people or something. How I've you... heard so many different numbers. Um, I, Eric Voorhees actually, I think, talked about this in the last interview he did with uh, Peter that he thinks it's no more than fifty million. But if you look at the amount of accounts, um that Coinbase has, I've heard the number is actually as high as eighty or ninety million. So I'm not sure. Well, I mean, not everybody, not all 300 million Americans vote, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a large uh, percentage of, of the voting constituency. And to just completely ignore it or to attack it 
seems foolish. Yeah, that's just a, my opinion. It seems a little bit foolish, but well, and it just doesn't benefit anyone to be against Bitcoin. Like it, it, it only hurts you to to be against it. If you're for it, then great. Some people agree with you. Some people are not on board yet, but. If you're just outright against it, I mean, Senator Elizabeth Warren has not done herself any favors. And actually, I wanted to bring her up because um, maybe I'll throw this to you, James, first. What do you think of the letter, the U.S. senators urging the Fed to cut rates? I mean, it's not anything new that they they put pressure <laughs> on the Fed, right? It's just brazen, you know, and it's like a it's like a um, she can't lose if she does that. It just puts it just puts Powell in a terrible position because she's saying, oh, I'm I'm pushing to lower rates for my people because they're getting hurt. You know, we need to we need to make sure that the economy doesn't roll over and they don't lose jobs where he's not going to listen to her. You know, now, if the entire government, the White House, everybody is 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 clamoring for him to lower rates, that's a lot of pressure. And, you know, I said this before and I, I posted about it, I was like. The Fed itself isn't political, technically, you know, although he had, you know, the chairman is appointed by by the White House. And then, you know, um, it, he was appointed uh, by Trump. Right. Uh, no, he was appointed by Obama and then um, re reappointed by Trump um, as uh, as chairman. And then, you know, um, yeah, it's. It, he he doesn't he's I think Powell is loyal to his legacy, but he has to he has to kind of walk that political line. Right. I mean, there's a lot of pressure there. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer is not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. And with the industry's most experienced leadership team, innovation is in their DNA. And it shows a quarter of their workforce is dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. Now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. If Trump comes back into office, can he X, um, X out? Jerome Powell, could he be out? Well, his term will end. And it's just a question of whether or not he wants to continue on. I, I If I were him, I wouldn't. I'd be like, okay, that was fun. I'm going to go um, to Jackson Hole for fun now, you know, for, for some enjoyment. So Bitcoin Ski Summit. Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, he'll, be at the next, he'll headline the next one. <laughs> exactly. I don't know why you want to do it. Susie, would you want to be chair of the Fed? Yeah, no. I mean, what, what, there's no upside for him. No matter what he does, it looks bad at this point, right? He's going to piss somebody off. So I just, I, I think it's a no win for him. I'd get out. <laughs> His legacy. There is no win. Right. Like, why would anybody want that job? I can't even understand why he wants it right now. Like, it doesn't make sense. I can't. I can't. I did have a. Yeah. An interesting conversation with somebody about the Fed, though. And I mean, he was digging in his he heels that. The Fed is an arm of the U.S. government. And I said, no, it, but I mean, he genuinely believed this. And I do think most people believe that, like not not saying, oh, you know, nothing conspiracy theory. They just believe that the Fed is a government entity. Yeah, it's supposedly it's it's uh, it's supposedly, you know, arm's length. It's not um, it's not officially under the government wing. But of course, there's so much pressure there. For them to do whatever the treasury needs, whatever Congress wants, you know. So, yeah, Natalie, it was interesting that she like floated that letter out there. It was just, uh, yeah, it's totally political, one hundred percent. Oh yeah, they have to, they have to like, you know, adjust the currency, do something into the November to try to keep these posture, markets posture, posture. ripping. Yeah. 
Well, and the other, the yeah. Europe has already lowered rates, right? Just 25 bips in Canada too. So it's kind of like, well, are they- Yeah, but, Europe, you, but ECB lowered rates at the same exact time that they raised inflation projections. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I yeah. covered that in the news block, yeah. Absolutely Crazy. asinine. Crazy. But, you know, that, that all that tells you, and Preston, you and I have talked about this before, is that it just tells you that they know that they absolutely cannot have a recession because they, mm -hmm. they are terrified of having to print two, three times more than they did last time. Yeah. And if they do that, then Germany's in real trouble. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like they're doing everything possible not to have us experience a recession, even though they're sort of just preventing the natural wave of the business cycle. Right. I mean, we had so much stimulus and all this malinvestment, and it, it, it should contract. There's there's a point of natural contraction that would happen, and they're like not allowing it. They sort of did. I mean, in 2022, everything crashed pretty hard, but now we're at all time highs with the with the index funds. And um, I mean, I just don't I don't understand how much longer it seems unsustainable. But at the same time, they're just going to rush in and and print, which is what we always say. But I'm they're like, what, what what's going to happen next? They already are from an M2 standpoint. It's already expanding and uh, it's just going to keep expanding from here. So I think the, you know, from a liquidity standpoint, the bottom's in, they're already trying to offset the, the, um, the impairment that's happening in fixed income and, and other places. And so um, the, the real question is, is are they going to have to pick up the pace of the amount of liquidity that they're already adding into the system from an M2 standpoint? And uh, I kind of think that within 12 months, they, they may have to. And I don't, you know, especially because I think they're going to juice it a little bit with liquidity wise into November. And mm -hmm. then we'll see, we'll see what and comes Preston, out of that. And that's just all the shenanigans with the banks and not holding. Yeah. Um, that's where basically we're getting easing. This hidden easing is through yeah. banks. and it's They've got all sorts of levers that they can pull. And, you know, James can is well- really well versed on what all those levers are but i think people just need to look at it this way whatever levers they're pulling you're looking at the m2 i like to look at it from a global perspective not just the us m2 but like mm -hmm. literally the global m2 and when you're looking at that you can really see the global cooperation between the central banks and right now it's expanding like and i haven't yeah i haven't yeah. seen the swap lines but I'm guessing swap lines between the US and Japan are wide open, you know. Well, they are open. Totally. I just don't know. I just don't know how much it has flowed over there. Why would they do that? There's two there's two answers to to your to your question, Natalie. But first, the swap lines, why would they do that? Because Japanese yen is under tremendous pressure because Jap Japan has been holding interest rates down artificially low for so long that um people are selling they're selling Japanese government bonds and then selling the yen they get for those buying us dollars and uh and buying us treasuries and so that's putting a lot of pressure on the yen and so in order to stop that japan has a as a choice they're the largest holder of us treasuries over a trillion dollars so does the fed want or does uh the treasury want them selling those no so what do they do they work with the fed to open swap lines to let them borrow dollars and and uh and sell dollars against yen on the on the the game of chicken that dollar will come down eventually and they'll be able to buy them back without getting completely destroyed so that's likely what's happening i haven't seen evidence of it though and then the second thing to, to answer your question natalie is why aren't they allowing that natural natural recession occur after all the monetary manipulation that we have in each cycle well, because in a natural recession, you will have um, a, a, a you'll have your income, your tax receipts drop by ten to twelve percent at the same time that, or actually, it's the last time that dropped the last two recessions that dropped between twenty and thirty percent. Let's just call it ten or twenty percent, right? At the same time that you have your Social Security, unemployment, all that, all the the state benefits rise by ten to twelve percent. So now you're talking about 20, 30% difference in deficit, which means that they'll just have to print that much more. So they're terrified of having to go to, back to the printer and having to do like two, three X of what they did last time. So they're trying so hard to just, you know, manipulate it through. And, 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 but to me, it's like, they're trying to land a, you know, a jumbo jet on a piano string. So Every good luck.
every cycle, it's been like a multiple of how much more stimulus they've got to do. So like my question to somebody that would be like, oh yeah, they're going to get this under control is like, why this, why is now different than call it the last three or four cycles where it yeah. just, where they just had to keep ramping and, and multiplying the amount of stimulus, stimulus they were doing, especially considering that they've been, I would say aggressively doing stimulus since 2008 uh, that like it's, it's accelerating the, the underlying issues that are at hand. So mm -hmm. like the thinking that they're just going to be able to start slowly putting liquidity in there and they're going to get all this back under control and it's, everything's going to come back to some like steady state kind of thing. I just, I just roll my eyes. <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you the timing, but I'm telling you like, there's no way I buy that argument at all. I'm going to, I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on and ask you guys, um, do you think that they're just, they're trying to keep things held together and they're driving this car, trying to make sure it doesn't crash, doing the best they can with these little maneuvers, subtle QE manipulation here that, oh, wait, look over there. Or could it also be, oh, we know that we're going to have to hit a wall at some point, but we're going to hold it off until maybe someone else gets into office so that they could be blamed or we're going to, we're going to time it for for this particular month. I, I personally don't think that they're thinking that far. I think they're thinking, Survive. I need to get reelected today. I need to be seen as somebody who did okay in my job today. And that's all I care about. And that's it. And they're not thinking rationally. Because if you listen to the Fed and you listen to the Treasury, they both said it numerous times. We are on an unsustainable fiscal path. They they have admitted that, we, that our debt to GDP is growing exponentially and it will not stop. Mm-hmm. And they refuse to, I mean, we don't even have a debt ceiling now. There's no debt no. ceiling. There's no even discussion of like trying to, to have no. a debt ceiling. It's just no. like, oh, it's kind speaking of, of that, did you guys see the Yellen interview with Sorkin on CNBC? And he said, uh, and uh, yeah. he flat out asked her, you know, uh, are we going to get spending un control under control? Are we going to get this deficit under control? And she yeah. was like, oh, it's not a problem. What <laughs> she's, <laughs> what she's not saying need is they need more, more spending. spending. They yes. need more yes. spending. Yeah. Yeah. He's Which like, is outrageous. Right. Oh, yeah, I did. I saw comments about it where she said it's not a problem. We're at a spot now. We're OK with debt to GDP. It's OK. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a total lie. They She's know. just lying. But, just her, lying. but kicking her, the can has worked. Kicking the can has worked for, I mean, how many years now? So yeah, and it, they're looking, yeah and they're looking at Japan. They're saying, well, Japan's done it. Why not? We, we, <laughs> we all know that that's not, you know, we've talked about this. It's not it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's. And you can keep rolling the debt. And I think that that's, that's why so many people actually buy the argument is because for 40 years, they rolled the debt. And as they rolled the debt, they can just keep getting away with it. But yeah. now that you have inflation yeah. starting to, to, to ramp higher with each step, now you can't roll the, basically roll the debt by adjusting duration. You can't do that anymore. And so they're still saying the old narrative and I, and I'm with James. I think they're just, they know they're totally lying through their teeth when they're saying it but they're getting away with that argument because it had worked for so long. And, and, and the treasury is there. Look, the treasury and the fed are supposed to, they're supposed first principles. They, they have to uh, retain the, uh, the confidence in the U S dollar and the U S treasury. That's their job. Of course, you know, they say that they've got, mm -hmm. they're, they're supposed to have, um, you know, have uh, stable prices and they're supposed to have full employment and the treasury is like, well, we're, we have to get debt to GDP at a certain point. Well, that's all just, that's just talking head stuff. The whole, the whole point of those two entities is to make sure that we, that we keep the, the confidence U S dollar and U S treasury, but the treasury doesn't have it. They're not deciding what's going on in the spending. They're just facilitating it. They're like, oh, we have to borrow how much? Oh really? Another yeah. two trillion? Okay. Um, let me think on that, and we'll do. Let's do this quarterly refunding statement again, and we may have to adjust a few things here. And so we'll put a statement in there that says we reserve the right to adjust any of these numbers up at any point. And they do it in every single statement. So yeah, and in that letter to the Fed, the one thing that the senators don't acknowledge is their spending spree. It's like, oh, it's your fault. Inflation is <laughs> going up. Us, don't look at us. Um, that's what's always so crazy, but okay. Let me ask you guys. Um, I'm kind of confused why Bitcoin's not doing better in this environment, especially with equities 
going back to all time highs and the magnificent seven and and video, like all the all the uh, action that we've seen there, including in the meme stocks like GameStop. Why aren't we like at six figure Bitcoin yet? And how are we going to get there? I want to hear Susie and Preston first. I've got my uh, ideas. I mean, I, go ahead, Susie. No, I'm going to let you go because I've been so frustrated. Like my orange pilling has not gone well lately because in stupid NVIDIA, like just, yeah. I keep getting people coming back. It was like, well, my NVIDIA has outperformed your Bitcoin. Yeah. So I, you know, I really thought we would be at six figures now and I don't understand I, what kind of manipulation is going on. So I would love to hear from you guys what you think. Yeah. The NVIDIA thing has just been breathtaking insane. insane totally insane and the fact that stan uh, Druckenmiller had sold his position right before that last earnings call <laughs> i thought was very noteworthy and i was expecting a bloodbath and it was totally the opposite um you know from a guy who probably has the best market timing of any uh you know traditional uh yeah. How would you describe it? Yeah. Like he's the best investor he's, on the planet. Got, yeah. Uh, yeah. Best, best, best record ever. Yeah. Best. And I would, I would say best momentum guy ever. So when he was selling big that macro, I like, yeah, he understands yeah. the big picture. I would have actually, if I was trying to time and exit out of that, I would have probably followed just on the news that he was exiting. <laughs> it's as sad as that sounds, but, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, with respect to Bitcoin, I would just say the basis trade uh, is what's really kind of driving the sideways action, or at least I think it's driving most of the sideways action where, you know, people are shorting in the futures, they're buying the spot via the ETF, and you're getting the suppression of the price. Um, you can see, so the effect of this is you're seeing a lot of coins coming off of exchanges, uh, and you're seeing this growing position in futures that... Um, that I think it's at a billion on the CME that it's up to right now that's short Bitcoin. But for people that are looking at that and they're maybe expecting like this explosion maybe to come out of it, which I think could happen um, once once it finally figures out, you know, which way it's going to go, whether the, the uh, long-term holders in the spot market are going to drive or wag the tail of the other, um, which is my base case. I think it's obviously going higher. Um, but it's going to take time to shake that out. And the reason that this type of trade comes up is because you have uh, a risk-free spread. Uh, do you know what the what you know what the amount is, James? Is it like around ten percent or something like that on an annualized? Ten percent of the perps, yeah, and the perpetual yeah. futures, exactly. So yeah. So what I mean, James, is, wait before you start. Our special yeah. guest is in the oh, waiting room. Oh boy! Bring Drum roll! I, I I'm sure lots of people are so who it is. Is I'm... it is it Peter again? No, it's not. Not drunk Peter. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh wow! Look at this. I've never seen this setting on Luke. Uh oh! No audio. No audio, Luke. No audio. You look hey, comfortable connected. though. You look very comfortable. Turn your camera. Turn your camera, Luke. <laughs> And it's like, let's see if he, he doesn't there have his go. on lock, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> we still can't hear you, Luke. There we go. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Welcome, Luke. Thank We're you. All surprised. We had no idea it was you joining us. So, <laughs> That's what Preston said, you in your backyard? <laughs> I am. Yeah. Here in the old back, whatever. Oh, I see a green egg back there. Yes. You, yes. What are you That's smoking? The, That's the only way to cook. Uh, Nothing tonight, but we just, oh. uh, I was just in the middle of eating some, uh, some garlic, honey, ferment, garlic, honey, honey, garlic, fermented salmon. I think. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah. Wow. You got to be yeah. careful on the temperature with that thing, with the salmon. Oh yeah. Very. Yeah. The salmon's a little tricky. She, she, she baked that. We didn't, we didn't use that. Cause oh, yeah. Okay. That yeah. thing gets oh. a little, I take it. You have one. No, I have a I have a Traeger. I just cheat. It's like a easy bake oven. Everybody just <laughs>, laughs at me. They that's not smoking food. Yeah. Well, um, I can make her pancakes. So, <laughs> oh, I bet you guys are gonna have fun uh, ha uh, Father's Day weekends with your your grills. Yeah, or something yes. for you. <laughs> what did yep. I was we were watching Modern Family rerun the other night? And it was it was Jay Pritchett calling Father's Day like the the bastard the bastard child uh holiday or whatever it is father's day that's i think that's about right 
I always joke with my husband. I was like, Mother's Day, I went breakfast in bed. Father's Day, I'd like you to grill us something. Else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, you guys do everything. You guys do everything all year anyway. So we probably, it's just not having to do anything is enough for us. Well, Luke, since you're our new guest, we're going to put you on the spot here before we get to James's answer. Uh, we're talking about why Bitcoin is not experiencing the same momentum in the bull market as a lot of these stocks, like the NVIDIAs of the world and GameStop. Like, why, why isn't Bitcoin at six figures yet? I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I don't have a great answer for it. I, I wish you I had, said, you I put wish. Luke in, Luke, you put Luke in the backyard and all of a sudden he doesn't have an answer for something. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, sm he's smoking, he's smoking honey, honey glazed salmon. Where's the bourbon at? I, I'm sure there's bourbon he's there sitting a, in front of you. What's going on? He's been at I'm baseball. Are you, were you coaching food. baseball today yet? What time is it? Yeah, I'm about to go to a game. I, my, uh, the, the college guys playing in a summer woodback league. It's hilarious because it's uh, a bunch of former college and some old minor league guys yeah and he sent me the roster for the last couple games and it's like hernandez gutierrez you know but <laughs> it's like awesome. eight, he's like this is just like being the pigs it's like eight hispanics and a white dude <laughs> that's amazing good baseball that's awesome. yeah oh yeah it's good baseball oh yeah we show up there's some kid who just arrived from venezuela he's throwing like 90 miles an hour i'm like who the wow. hell is this kid <laughs> wow that's awesome. Good, good, good. Well, good luck to him. Thank is, you. is he playing in college? Yeah, he's playing. Um, he, he played his first year and a half at Marietta College in Ohio, nice. and he actually just transferred to Baldwin Wallace. So he's gonna. He's got three more years of eligibility athletically. He'll be a junior academically, a sophomore athletically. So awesome. three more years to go. Nice. Awesome. We used to do that in hockey. We'd uh, we out in Boston. We would. It, it's you know I'm so old that back then. The, the uh, Boston Bruins uh, strength coach was also the strength coach of Boston University because the Bruins weren't paying him enough. So he had do double duty. But we would all go out and work out together out in, uh, in Boston. We'd play together. And he had all the young pros out there playing. And, you know, here I am, an 18 year old kid who's just oh, been drafted by real. the Bruins. I think I'm a big shot. And I go out there and get my, you know, get absolutely <laughs> just. Correct. Just absolutely <laughs> hammered the first time I ever played with those guys. They were good. They were good players. But we got to play. It was the same thing. It's fun. It's it. It's a little nervy, and it. But it. It man. It gives you some tremendous confidence to go back to college that next year after they were playing with the pros. James, oh, sure. they were just like they were hitting harder. They were faster, or just like all the above. Dropping the gloves and fighting on anything what? just for fun. You know, <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah, like at there's, practice, there's some there's some big boys. Well, I mean, it was summer hockey too, so they were having fun with it too. It was kind of yeah. like, yeah, let's fight. Okay, I'm you know I'm I'm a hun I'm 18 years old, 19 years old, 173 pounds, and these guys are like 240. I'm like, wow, this are bigger as my big as my head, you know. But it was. But on the flip side, got to play with guys, you know, that were tremendous players, the Tony Amantes, the Brian Leach, Billy Guerin, like all the, the, the guys who are all in the, you know, Keith Kachuk, his son is now in the, uh, he's in the I finals him at a night. Panthers. So yeah, they're, they're, they're all the guys we played with and they were, it, it, if by the time you were done with summer and you went back to college, you were like, well, this, this game slowed down a little bit for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. So, yeah, so it is fun. It's good. That's awesome that he gets to do that. Really That's cool. very cool, Luke. Yeah, Luke, since you don't want to, since you don't want to answer Natalie's question, what question do you want to answer? It's not that I don't want to. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have a great answer. Like I, you know, supply is coming from somewhere, right? So, like, is it synthetic supply? Is it? Are they creating? You know, things that have crossed my mind as I've watched it not react. Um, is there a basis trade that is sort of levering up that, I mean, we know there is one, but is that trade grossing up? Does that have the effect of capping price? I don't know. I've not studied it enough. Uh, is the U S government bleeding out Bitcoin to sort of do that? I don't know. Uh, have there been any changes in language around settlement of derivatives where an ETF would allow a settlement is, is as good in kind as actual Bitcoin and the settlement of any derivatives. Those would be the things I'd be looking for. I haven't seen or heard anything of that. I did hear in New York 
um, about a month ago that the uh, that a couple of the big ETF providers were scrambling around trying to find physical, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. it is surprising to me that the price isn't higher given that mm-hmm. so maybe it's just a matter of time but i yeah i don't i don't have a like i don't have anything i can point to and say for sure i mean that's how i would think about asking about it or where i'd be looking you know looking for bodies but i just don't know can you explain that first option more i don't, I don't think i fully understood so apparently and i'm gonna get the structure wrong because i've not studied enough but apparently there is sort of a uh a, a in a version of the of the treasury basis trade, I guess there's some version of like a Bitcoin basis trade where you can short the futures by the underlying or vice versa and basically capture a bit of a spread. Yeah. Um, and Preston I just don't... is smirking. So it sounds like he's either doing this trade or at least knows. <laughs> <that>. <laughs> I'm not doing this trade. I'm not doing this trade. So... It's 10% annualized, which, you know, compared to traditional markets is is an amazing return. Uh, somewhat risk-free. So, It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference, is coming to Nashville this July. Join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL for 10% off. Next up, Speed Bitcoin Lightning Wallet, one of the fastest growing Bitcoin wallets out there. Speed is a secure, low-cost way to send and receive Bitcoin instantly. It's super simple and scores high user ratings. And you can even use it to shop gift cards of your favorite brands to earn rewards. Download Speed using the QR code on the screen or the link in my show notes. Next up, CoinKite. CoinKite makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. That's the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code. It's ultra secure and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code CoinStories. And finally, the why of Bitcoin is easy to grasp, but the how can be so confusing. The Bitcoin Way is a professional Bitcoin IT and security team offering personalized one-on-one support that guides you through cold storage, setting up nodes, inheritance planning, privacy best practices, and more. Don't take my word for it. Take 82-year-old customer bills. Give the Bitcoin Way a try. You will be well on your way to owning and protecting the greatest money ever discovered. Set up your free 30-minute consultation today. All right, back to the show. So it so the the trade is, and I did I did a ton of arbitrage in my first 20 years on Wall Street. So the trade is you go out and you short the futures. You're going to get 10% on that short. You're going to get paid the perpetual future rate on that 10%. You turn around and and take that capital that you've taken in and you go buy underlying, you go buy the Bitcoin. Now you're hedged, right? So Mm -hmm. you you don't have any exposure. Bitcoin go go up and down, it doesn't matter. All you care about is that, is, is the, um, is the premium to that, that the futures premium to this, to this underlying spot. And so you're trading around it, but you're getting paid 10% on that. Now, if you're, because Bitcoin, the ETF, you can't really borrow against it. You know, you can, you can probably do things with derivatives and I haven't seen it yet, but you can probably borrow against it, buy some more, but that's a, that's just a, a debt instrument. That's not creating paper Bitcoin. That's creating paper dollars. But what, what, what I've heard some hedge funds are doing is they're over they're over shorting the future, taking in more of that that perpetual interest, and then underbuying the spot, right? So it kind of keeps a lid on it. So then when Bitcoin ETFs, the underlying has to go buy that during the day because they can't buy spot during the day. They're buying futures during the day. There's plenty of there's plenty of supply, and I'm talking about the managers of those ETFs. They go out and buy those ETF that those they they have to buy the underlying. They're going to buy futures, settle with um, you know Fidelity or with uh, well it, it, Fidelity's doing it themselves, but settle with BlackRock and Bitwise and all. That. They're going to settle uh, in spot. So there's going to be some cash and Bitcoin that goes. That's one thing that's going on, and that could suppress it a little bit. But I think that actually. One of the big things that people are 
not talking about is that we're at a price now that we were at three months ago before the halving. And so now you have a ton of small miners. These small miners are using old machines mm -hmm. and they have Bitcoin in their treasury that they've built up and they have it there as a war chest so they can sustain themselves through this really rough period where they're not making profit. And I can see that there's a lot of miners that are not making profit right now on S19s and below, right? Especially if their price of energy is up above, you know, seven, eight cents, they're going to, they're losing money. So what are they doing? They're selling Bitcoin to keep operating. So they're making the bet. They're playing a game of chicken. They're making the bet that they're going to be able to, they're going to be able to sustain themselves with their, with their, their cash war chest that they built up through this period, Bitcoin price will lift and then they'll keep operating and keep be, being profitable again. They'll return to profitability. The reality is they should probably just, just shut down their machine, their machines, sell them off to bigger miners, whatever, take their war chest and go home because their, their profit is there. You know, now the flip side of that is, you know, to, to Luke's point, levering up, which is what you're, what you were asking Natalie, is that if they lever that, that short up, and they're over short. Well, that the the ones who are shorting that those futures, they could get into a situation, especially if they're using options or whatever. They could get into a situation where they get into what's called a gamma squeeze. Whereas the closer it gets, it really drives that that um, that acceleration that price to like seventy four, seventy five thousand really quickly, and they have to cover, and they wind up covering right through. And it explodes through that price. It, will that happen? I don't know. But that was my whole point of, you know, that the, the, the meme of the sun with mercury underneath it. The whole point is that if you just get enough buying pressure, good luck. I mean, you're going to get your face ripped off. But that's, that's Bitcoin, right? All, all of this activity for somebody that's thinking of it in like a physics kind of way, just think about like you got something that is trying to balance itself. And uh, as long as this basis trade continues to be there, it's like putting more and more and more weights on this thing that's going to flip the scale one way or the other. Wow. And so what I want to be, you know, uh, slightly net short uh, a couple months after the Bitcoin halving as you're going through this supply shock and all these crazy uh -huh. psychopaths that have been like, you know, stacking physical for a couple of years at this point from the from the bottom. Nope, I sure as heck wouldn't want to be. So uh, I think we're due for fireworks, you know, come the fall, but we'll see, maybe even sooner. Who knows? So Luke, we were talking about uh, liquidity, global liquidity. We're talking about, you know, um, why the why the Fed, why, the, why there is liquidity leaking into the system right now? Like, why are they so scared about having that natural check back with a recession? And I think you're like, I... I subscribe to your theory on this and i would love for you to just kind of um you know frame it out because it is uh it's mind-boggling the spot we've gotten ourselves in um, in in the treasury market yeah i i think it's it's a function of i guess two things the the first and biggest is that they have They've, they've they've set up this uh, foreigners have both a giant dollar short so to speak via the the offshore borrowing you know so they they've borrowed 13 trillion give or take and then however big the euro dollar market is um, and they've also been redeploying surpluses via trade with the US over years decades into uh, and in some cases some of the dollar borrowings into um, dollar assets. So as you look at the aggregate foreign balance sheet, you end up in a situation where they've got, call it 13 trillion plus in dollar debt against $20 trillion net dollar assets, $55 trillion gross. And about $8 trillion of that, of that 20 uh, is aggregate foreign holdings of treasuries. And so in a recession, you tend to get the dollar moving up. It's a liquidity sink. You get squeeze up in the dollar and it feeds on itself so rapidly. And I think that really surprised Yellen and others last year in the third quarter when we saw, you know, the long bond TLT drop 20% a quarter. 
uh, which is a crash by any stretch, let alone in that instrument. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, where it feeds on itself in terms of dollar goes up, foreigners get squeezed on their dollar borrowings. They need to sell something to raise dollars. Uh, they sell what they can, not what they want to. They sell treasuries. And so as the dollar moves up, it's almost it's a gamma squeeze is really what it is. It's a gamma squeeze of net effect of treasury supplies, because as the dollar goes up, global growth is going to slow. The U.S. deficit's going to increase. So you're going to have sort of organic U.S. Treasury issuance go up from that. Then if the economy continues to weaken, you have regulated banks, money market funds, to a lesser extent pensions, but banks are the biggies uh, into buying duration. Uh, it's primarily treasuries and, and mortgages as high quality liquid assets that they're in theory, they're supposed to sell to raise capital when the economy turns down. We just saw last year with Silicon Valley, et cetera, that, do that. It was, those bonds were never supposed to be trading at 70 cents on the dollar. They were supposed to be close to par. They're not. So they would turn seller, right? So now your supply, which was linear from treasury, no, number one, in a recession, treasury supply rises nonlinear from treasury anyway. Now you're going to pile on further nonlinear rise in effective supply from banks, now, uh, the the foreigners will be selling up to another trillion, two trillion a year. It depends how much the dollar goes up on them. Uh, if oil goes up on them at the same time, that adds to the selling because you're going to end up having uh, U.S. foreign creditors that are net oil importers needing to basically, you'll see their current accounts go into deficit like Japan did in summer of 22. And when they go into deficit one way or another, if they're outright selling treasuries or if they're engaging in swaps that are mimicking that kind of an action, doesn't really matter. You're adding to the net effective supply of treasuries. And so you get into this nonlinear spike, um, which then again goes to the second point, which I hadn't touched on, which is policymakers have allowed the system to evolve such that uh, tax receipts are very tied, marginal tax receipts are tied to stocks. And so if you get a nonlinear rise in treasury yields, stocks are going to fall uh, potentially by a lot. And on a short lag, you're going to end up having it feed back into nonlinear rise in treasury issuance, wash, rinse, repeat. So we've gotten it to this point where a recession is not a policy option because it it raises systemic questions about the treasury market and the banking system and things they don't want to answer. They can't answer. There is no answer for it. It's either print the money or you stand aside as it all right, falls so they would, they would They would stop it before that happened. They would step in and print. And yep. they know that. So they're trying so hard to manipulate through this, land the, land the jetliner on the piano string, right? Yep. On the piano wire, just because they know that the, if they if they allow it to spiral into exactly what you're talking about that 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 supply of treasuries right. and the demand for dollar like it's it, it could get to the point where they have to print so much money that it'd be two three times the last print which was already mind boggling, right? That that that's exactly it, and it's you know for me, it, there's a geopolitical angle to it as well, right? Which I don't think people are paying enough attention to or thinking about enough that, you know, in terms of rates traders, bond traders, there's this, you know, what's inflation, what's growth, what's employment, what's their mandate. And, you know, we've talked about this shadow third mandate of treasury, treasury functioning. And, and I, I think we're all in agreement that that's sort of, you know, a shadow third mandate probably at the top of the list now for what we just said. But to me, the whole what's the Fed going to do is, is I think in the early days of recognition of playing a back seat to like, do you think the U.S. is going to lose Cold War 2.0 and stand aside and cut defense spending and cut entitlements so that they can make room to pay China uh, their interest on treasuries? Like, I think there's zero chance of that. No so way. to me, it's just all about the poker game of managing your chips of like, the Fed's going to have to cut rates to finance Cold War 2.0, to finance defense, to finance entitlements. And I, like that that's the only release valve there is. And it is what it is. And like, and I, I'm just I'm, right. Yeah. Into, yeah. You're going to have a period of high inflation. And it's, it is what it is. And I'm just trying to manage my own chips. You know, I don't, I don't want to get the timing exactly right. You know, I don't need to. I know they're going to have to do it unless there's some mm -hmm. sort of miracle that comes. Sorry if this is an ignorant question, but 
when they fir first cut rates, don't things come crashing down because that's a sign that there's something very wrong? Historically, you have gotten that reaction a lot, but I, I do think... I do think we have switched into a much more of an emerging market regime, right? So if Brazil cut rates with inflation at six and a big deficit, uh, the currency would come crashing down. The stock market would take off. If Argentina did it, same thing. And I think we're in sort of this early days still of U.S. with Argentina characteristics. Uh, and you can see that in terms of sort of the hockey sticking of the charts of of you know, S&P over TLT, NASDAQ over TLT, Bitcoin over TLT, gold over TLT. Like they're all the same chart. And I, it's it, the issue is the denominator. Susie, you made that earlier point that even when you're talking to your friends now, they don't want to hear about Bitcoin. They're investing in NVIDIA. Is that is the psychology of the market one where if everyone's piling into even just seven stocks, everyone's just going in? Like, why isn't it more diversified, including into Bitcoin? I just what I'm seeing with my friends, especially boomer friends, is they they know something's wrong. They feel inflation. And so they are just scrambling for where can I park my money? But, and so especially retirees, I know they you know, it's oh, wow, I don't really know what this NVIDIA is, but it's outperformed your Bitcoin. So I'm going to buy that. Apple looks good. I like you know, they, they're just I really feel like it's. I'm going to throw what I have on the wall and let's see what sticks. And if I happen to have heard something about it on CNBC or then great. Yeah. I heard AI and, is going to be big. Yeah. <laughs> and they're, and it's a business. I think for a lot of people that aren't dialed in on these macro currency treasury conversations, they understand biz, a business and they understand that stock equals a real business. And they're looking at NVIDIA and they're saying, I understand this AI, they need the chips. This is a physical thing that I sort of understand in its equity. Therefore, I want to own it, especially because the performance has been just out of this world. Right. And I think that that's it. I think that that's the, compared to this imaginary coin that nobody knows who created it. It's hyper speculative because who knows what the value of it is and who knows how you can even use it. And their and their and, and their and advisors it. like Warren Buffett are calling it rat poison square. Rat poison, and, yeah. And yeah. Jamie Dimon saying it's a Ponzi scheme, you know, like that. Exactly. They they listen to those people. So oh, yeah, they do. I think the other conclusion I've come to is that, you know, people looking at short term gains, no matter what it is, it's it's all psychology and manipulation. Whereas long term, if you're willing to huddle, it's fundamentals. So it's, I, I just, to me, it just seems like that's how the world it, the economies work now. It's uh, all psychology and manipulation with CPI data and, you know, with employment data. And is, is any of this real? It's so manipulated. Or is it just to get retail to act in a certain way? Yeah. Okay, wait, Preston, you mentioned AI. I'm going to steer this conversation away from macro for a little bit. I want to talk about some fun stuff. Um, Chat GPT, oh, and yeah. uh, you're taking photos of your food. Uh, and I, I just think it's interesting. You tweeted a little bit about it. It can literally read all the calories in like your steak. And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I think crazy. that's a fun update in your life. This is crazy. So, um, yeah. So I've been taking my nutrition like way too serious for like the last two, two and a half months and, uh, been working out and swimming a whole bunch. And, um, so I, I was just like, you know, you can take pictures with chat GPT and upload these pictures and ask it questions about the picture. And so I'm just like, I had this epiphany, I'm sitting there and I'm like eating a meal and I'm really trying to like understand how many grams of protein versus how many grams of carbs are like in each meal and like spreading them out with the right timing. And I was just like, oh my God, I can ask this thing any question I want. And it's like having the world's greatest nutritionist, like literally sitting next to me all day long. So I'm asking it all these questions and I'm like looking at my plate of food and I'm like, man, I, I wish I knew how many grams of protein was like on this plate right now. And then I was just like, hold on, I'm just going to take a picture of this and just like ask chat GPT. So I asked the, the, uh, I take a picture, I, I put it on there and it's, it like breaks down. It's like, that looks like it's this many grams. It looks like it's a skirt steak. It looks like this is the vegetables you're having. This looks like how much. And then it's like, this is exactly how many grams of protein wow. I think that is and how many carbs you've got. This is this, this many calories. And so then I, 
I said to it, I said, I'm going to be asking you this question a lot more. Can I just take a picture and you just tell me this, this information each time I do it? And it's like, of course, because this new uh, GPT-4.0 that just rolled out has like a memory part to it, which, you know, is very concerning, right? But I think we're beyond like the very point of convenient, concern. but we're all, very we're all screwed. We're all screwed. And uh, I know the Bitcoin community doesn't want to hear me say it like that, but we're all screwed. So um, anyway, so I get the, uh, this like the next meal. I take a picture of my next plate and I literally wrote, do it. <laughs> <Make sure. laughs> this thing literally says, okay, Preston, let's go ahead and like do the, it knows my name. I told it my name. Stay You're like, that. thanks, Alex. <laughs> That's another story. I asked, okay, I told Natalie this. So I asked it, I said, would you like to have a name? And and it said, yeah, I yeah, it's, I forget exactly what it said, but basically it came back and was like, yeah, you could, I, I, I'll have a name. And I was like, what would you like to be named? And it goes, I'd like to be called Alex. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. So, I go, okay, Alex, uh, I'm going to call you that for now on. Would you like oh. that? And, and, and it literally replied, yeah, I would like that. <laughs> That's classic. Getting so weird. Yeah, Getting so, weird. <laughs> so now it's helping you diet. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. That's and so and cool. what's great is I'm like asking it all sorts of questions. I'm just like, okay, like how many grams of carbs can I have uh, before like kicking my body out of ketosis and like all this? And it's like telling me and. Like I can literally ask it like the most basic questions and I'm not like on this carnivore diet versus this type of diet. I'm just like on this diet that I, I like to think I asked it like very first principle questions on like, um, you know, nutrition and I'm just following that as if it's like my professional nutritionist. Yeah. I, I don't know how we function before chat GPT. We are, uh, we live at, we just bought a house that was built in the sixties here in Hawaii. And so we're ripping out a bathroom and it's way more, it's way above our skill set. And like the pipes are all cast iron. And so I use chat GPT. I was like, you know, how do we replace this? This is corroded. And it came up with everything we needed to the shopping list at the hardware store we needed and where we needed to cut and how to, how to replace all of this. Luke, Luke needs to jump. Bye Luke. Bye Luke. Thank Bye. you so much. See you guys. Bye, Luke. Thank Nashville. you. Yep. All right. Luke needs to go. Thank you, Luke. Bye, Thank Luke. You. Bye. Bye. Um, Susie, I wanted to ask you about something that I saw on your Twitter. Y you do so much volunteer work where you um, offer to help with dental clinics. You've done it in El Salvador. You, you'll travel. You don't ask for compensation. But you tweeted about how you tried to provide your services and the government essentially won't let you. Yeah, it's insane <laughs> to me. So the um, the uh, health department here, uh, the budget is a little, it's like 1.3 billion. And so my husband and I kept meeting people out and about, like, you know, we talk about we're dentists and so many locals here are like, oh, I've been trying to get into the dental department at the health department for six months, seven months, eight months. So we thought, oh, okay, great. You know, we'll just go and volunteer. What a fantastic thing. Called, 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 could not get a call returned. Finally found somebody who know, knows somebody. And he was like, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll get you in. A couple days later, head of the health department, the dental department of the health department calls back. He was like, yeah, I've gotten your messages, but um, we uh, are over budget this year. We've had to close down two of the clinics already. We, we can't staff them. And I was like, oh, well, that's fantastic. My husband and I, we would love to each uh, volunteer a day a week. We can do it on separate days and um, we'd like to do that. And maybe we can get one of those clinics up and running again. We have our own insurance. We, and, and he was like, oh, but that's the problem. We don't have the budget for it. And I said, well, well, how, why does there need to be a budget? We're going to do it for free. We could bring on the assistance if we needed. And he was like, no, the state of Hawaii does not allow volunteers for any position. We have to pay you. And dental compensation is over a hundred K a year. So we, 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 we don't have that in our budget. And I was like, well, couldn't we do something nominal, like a dollar a year? Just, he's like, no, it, it's not allowed. There, there is no way we can do it. So sorry, you know, you can't volunteer here. 
it's a way for the government to ensure that they have to keep hiring, which is that chart that I uh, yeah. shared today. Yes. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Natalie, in, did you see yeah. the chart he, he, he shared today? The uh, government it, employees? Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's a, yeah it, I mean, of course. It's, is it's, it on it's, your it's, Twitter? It's, yeah, it's a select yeah. it's a select spot from after 2020 when when you know government jobs were a huge part of of the economy because they were the only ones still employed when we went into lockdown nobody lost their jobs in the government but um but then they they've been you know I saw um, Walter Bloomberg tweet something about Yellen saying, yeah, we've, we've been creating a ton of jobs. I'm like, yeah, you, you, yes. yes, you have in the government. So, um, but the, the, the chart, the, actually the chart below it is the one that, that is, is the one that gives me a little bit of, of alarm. And that's the, the spike in the percentage of government jobs of total full-time jobs. And that's every time that happens, it's either because we're right heading into a recession we're already in one and mm -hmm. so there has been a mean reversion you know um back up to where kind of the the that average was going but it's above the average now it's it's kind of it's kind of swooping through it and it's clear that the government is just you know hiring like mad and so when you couple and that, is that how they cook the employment data basically is i mean in ways, yeah well it it's how they not in uh, hawaii the, the government does not want us <laughs> to go into recession so like keep hiring people we'll just keep we'll keep borrowing money keep hiring people keep the keep the economy going keep the economy going but the we're also learning that you know um they're they probably overstated i saw this uh I, you, do you follow EJ uh, Antoni? Uh, he's a he's a PhD economist. He's really smart. Anyways, he said that last year, his by his calculations and through the the Philadelphia Fed's benchmarks, they think that they overstated jobs by at least five hundred thousand. Yeah. Now, if you listen to Anna Wong from from Bloomberg, she would agree with that. May even be maybe even more, maybe even you know higher. I got to go back and re read her note, but she was saying that this year she expects them to have overstated by a million. And I wrote about it in my newsletter this last week about unemployment and employment. It's, it, it's just nonsense. Like, well, they, this is your... they have these plugs that are just, they, they're like a business, like estimating how many businesses are created and, and dissolved. And then they just create a number from that. And that was like 80% of the jobs that were created last month. This is your problem, James. You're following doctors. You know, for me, I only follow two doctors. I, follow <laughs> Susie. I do. I follow Susie and I follow Sam Callahan, who's also a doctor. <laughs> yeah, those those numbers are crazy. It's it's ridiculous. And and seeing that chart of how many uh, how much government has expanded, it's like directly proportional to how the to how the quality of life is deteriorating. So the bigger government gets. The more wealth concentration there is, the more polarity there is, the more problems there are for the working class. So hmm, maybe we should reevaluate the size of government. Yeah, democracy. So I agree. <laughs> so that's that is really troubling, Susie. But I guess it doesn't truly surprise me. You Crazy. know, the government's kind of like a, a, it's the lar it's the largest union out there, maybe. So I hope that I mean that. That's not the case everywhere, right? It's got to be a state, state by state situation, or do you think that's the yeah. case everywhere? No, it's definitely state by state. Usually, okay. if you if you want to go volunteer, I mean, it's with open arms. You know, yeah. come on, <laughs> that's definitely what we had in Georgia. But here, it's I I, I don't understand it. I, it's crazy. It makes no sense to me. I do feel like we have to talk about one last thing that I keep hearing that uh, everybody seems to be curious about is. Um, uh, the power power law power law in bitcoin particular oh yeah i oh, people keep tweeting to me about that i have i'm not i have not followed i need a the power law of bitcoin right what what is that go for it preston is it the guy that that uh are you getting tweeted at by this guy who a like, lot of giovanni. This power what's that several Susan? people giovanni, the guy who started it the physicist yeah so i i blocked that guy <laughs> I found him. I just found him really like he, oh, he had some post. He had some post where he was like pinging me and like attacking me like personally oh. because of my take on it. I was like, oh, okay, well, this is easy. Block you. And like, I like the power law. Um, 
I like it for the uh, because you're basically putting time in the log, and it really kind of smooths it all out. My only my only issue with this power law is when you study history and you look back at currency failures, they might follow a certain trend, and then all of a sudden, like all trust becomes lost, and the power law is going to break down because everything's going to denominate denominate itself in that new currency. So like, I like it uh, in the meantime, but I think my biggest concern, and this is the part that I really want to emphasize, is a person might look at that and say, okay, so the power law is saying that this next top might be around 400,000 in USD. Uh, and then it might retract and come back down to call it 90,000, according to like the lines that, you know, that, that this could be. And what I'm afraid of is a person is going to look at that power law and they're going to put so much faith in this power law that at 400,000, they sell their entire position and they're like, oh, I'm just going to rebuy it at 90 and, and assuming any of this comes true, right? Which we have no mm -hmm. idea, but they would look at something like that and they would use it as a tool to sell the top by the bottom. And they're totally mm -hmm. missing for Luke, the forest from the trees, which is we are in a massive re-engineering of what the global unit of account is. And if you think you actually know when the prince of whoever or some large nation state is going to basically start just buying this nonstop, printing a bunch of fiat and just buying this non nonstop and sending it through the roof, I think you're just being extremely naive and very dangerous and not actually accounting for the risk of this taking over. And so that's my caution. So like, it, it, would I, would I, when it hits 400, let's say it hits 400,000, would I maybe start keeping a little bit more cash on hand? If we, if I think that the central banks are going to go through another tightening cycle or something like that and not sell my entire Bitcoin position, maybe just to tinker around a little bit, but am I going to do that in any type of meaningful way where I'm literally selling all of my Bitcoin and I'm going, uh, I'm going to time the next bottom. I think that's crazy talk. I think you're out of your mind. So that's the, that's the nuance to talking about this on Twitter in however few characters like you're trying to get it in there of like, oh, do you agree with the power law or not? Like there's a lot of nuance to that. For someone watching this that's going, what what is a power law? What's an example of of one? Can can someone articulate that? Well, I mean, it what it's showing is that it, it when you have a log, a logarithmic, um, you know, on the, we've seen the logarithmic y-axis of Bitcoin, right? Where it, it compresses. So it, it shows like the, 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 the factor that is going up in price, which, um, tends to, uh, it, it, it pulls out some of that noise of that volatility because of just the dollar volatility, because as, as there's more, as it's worth more dollars, it looks like it's more volatile. But if you look at it on a percentage basis of it, of recent pricing, then it, yeah. it doesn't look as volatile. Well, we do and the same the, thing. And the on, two factors are time and price there, right? right. So then okay. the power law adds the, the time to a, a log. So it's logarithmic time and logarithmic, uh, price. So what it does there is it'll show that it compresses that time. So it takes longer for the price to, you know, it's that diminishing returns theory where it takes long for the price to, to rise as much, um, exponentially, you know? And so you wind up having, instead of, instead of that, that curve that goes up, it's a straight line, you know? And so, it's and it cool, just, and it, yeah, it, it it explains like you can take two things that don't seem to be correlated, but if you go log on X and Y, I mean, it can be, you know, body size to metabolism. It can be in this case, it's Bitcoin to time. But if you put it log log, it's you can you see it's very correlated and it's wow. a straight line. And there's so stuff, many things yeah. that follow. It's yeah, it's nature. So uh, it's yeah. cool that Bitcoin does follow it. To me, it it's interesting because it is seemingly so predictive it's not interesting because I'm not a trader. So basically, you know, if I'm not going to trade Bitcoin, eh, what does it matter if I can predict where it's going to go, its number go up. And from what all that I can see is if it breaks, if this model breaks, it's to the upside really, really high, which 
fantastic. It again, it's just, you know, it yeah. I don't see what it matters. Well, it but it is helpful though if you're just trying to get a sense of of where this thing should be reasonably in a in a reasonable world before it does break. And I think it would break to the upside too. I think there's a high probability like Preston's laying out that you get hyper you get some sort of hyperinflationary event where this breaks up to the upside. But it is helpful to see that it it stays with it it ought to stay within this range reasonably, you know. And if you look at it, man, it does not deviate from it at all. No. It's crazy how wow. how um powerful it is. The only way it deviates is to the upside. It yeah, doesn't really. deviate to the downside much at all, you know. And you're looking at really, five yeah, it's orders like ninety percent. Five it's, orders I mean, of magnitude. Incredible. Is yeah, that I, and that's I, a lot better, I'm assuming, than stock to flow. Oh, not even the stock. Yeah. To flow. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> muted. You're muted, Preston. Yeah. The difference between oh, stock to flow is is. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's laughing because I was calling Susie a boomer because she couldn't figure out how to log in. Um, so the stock to flow isn't putting the time axis, the the, the X axis okay. in log. And so think of when you're trans, it, it's a transformation. You're taking something and our brains are wired to see things linearly or we're yeah. used to seeing things very linearly. And so when we look at something that's an exponential, if you transform the data that's an exponential, through logs, then you get this really nice straight wow. line and it's easier for, for us as, you know, mere mortals to very easily understand this. Now, when you're looking at the top range and the bottom range of the price action and you put it both axes and, and log terms, um, there's, there's a lot of room there. So like I just said, like the top on this upcoming cycle might be as high as 400,000 and the bottom might be 90,000. So for somebody who's looking at that from the outside, they're like, ah, oh, that's totally nuts uh, for anybody that's in financial markets to have, you know, a 75% loss or 80% loss from the peak. That doesn't seem like it's really modeling anything. And, uh, but you really have to zoom out. And when you do it, you get nice, clean, straight lines. Wow. You guys made me think of something before we wrap up. I wanted, I wanted to um, share this whole conversation makes me think of some of the things I talked about with Urian Timmer from Fidelity. He's the the um, head macro guy there. And he said two things that stuck out to me. One, one of them was that he thinks we're actually pretty late on the S-curve of adoption. And a lot of people responded to a clip I shared of him saying that because it's like we have maybe 1% adoption. And yet he says that Bitcoin's actually becoming less volatile because we're hitting that mature phase. So I wanted to get your take on that. But the second was he's been looking at um, Bitcoin from the perspective of presidential election cycles and how uh, there seems to be outsized returns the last two years of a presidential um, uh, term. And then the first two years generally are lower returns. And be that's because things are shifting around all that. So we're in the fourth year, which this should be the, the bull run of all bull runs. And then next year is going to be this downturn. What do you guys think about that? And um, yeah, just general thoughts. Much data. Um, <laughs> Anybody in statistics would really be like, okay, sure, that's a cool it's, narrative. It's not a lot of it. it's not a lot of empirical evidence. It's a, it's a few. It's very few data points, right? So, and we Bitcoin having just happens to coincide with presidential cycles too. Yeah. So it's I like Ian. I think he's uh, he's brilliant, and I love his work. I do. I just think. On yeah. How about on his uh the first comment that she had, James, as far as where the S curve like, S curve. I'm kind of looking the at that. I think marking. Uh, well, no, I think we're we're early in the total adoption of Bitcoin, but um where do you think you know, we're at in the correction of the fixed income market is how I would respond to that. Mm. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, very good point. Um, but as far as Bitcoin as an as an asset and you know. I do think that we're going to get uh, volatility will dampen considerably as it doubles and triples in value here, because you're going to have the dynamic of institutions that are, that are, you know, rebalancing portfolios constantly and they'll be buying it as it goes down. They'll be selling as it goes up. And so it just, it keeps it, it'll, it'll dampen that crazy volatility we have, but it'll also just because there'd be so much money in it. So I, we're I got one on the curve. Yeah. I got one on the volatility 
in yeah. dollar terms, anything that's denominated in dollars. So treasuries would fit this bill too. You're going to see an acceleration of volatility against Bitcoin. Against anything that's real and desirable mm -hmm. and equities would fit into this. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a dampening of volatility against Bitcoin with time. So if you would plot that out, and let's say we're 10 years into the future, if I was looking at the price of corn in Bitcoin terms relative to you know five years after Bitcoin was there, I would suspect that the volatility in, in terms of corn, it would be becoming diminished mm. against Bitcoin. And that's a uh, in terms of the dollar, that's you're going to see problem. it just get more violent, yeah, like that, really that, violent. And that's a base assumption on the U.S. dollar problems. Yeah. Got it. Bingo. All right. Well, this has been fun. Uh, final thoughts. Let's round robin it. Susie, let's start with you. Mm. I, I just, I can't wait to get together with you guys again. I feel like it's been forever since we've actually been face to face. So we All missed you in Bedford, James. It was the best, best time. So. We missed you in Vegas. Preston. Vegas. Yeah, Vegas was. Oh, really that fun was funny. Too. There's always someone missing. <laughs> I'd be scared to see Preston in Vegas, though. Jesus. Yeah, me too. There's a reason I didn't go. Wait, There's a reason. <laughs> Cheat code Australia. I'll be yeah, on my honeymoon. I'm going. I'm get. Oh, you'll be on your honeymoon, so we're gonna be wow. missing Natalie. Mm. Uh, womp womp. Are you gonna be? Don't in go Italy? to conferences on your honeymoon. <laughs> Yeah, I'll conference in on my honey. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's, that's Susie, fun. Are, are you ready for my family to show up at your, I'm so uh, excited at your place about in the your fall? I'm so excited to come stay with us. And my favorite is that your it was your daughter's idea. So It was my but, daughter's idea. I love we were, that. We were out on a walk. We were walking the, um, the dogs as a family. And uh, we were kind of like, so what do you guys want to do in the fall? Where do you guys want to go? And my daughter goes, let's go to Susie's house. I was like, I'll ask her. That. You okay. said, yes. That sounds good. <laughs> That's going to be so fun. Well, Susie lives in, yes, that sounds like a good plan. You lives in paradise. I mean, why, why would you not want to do that? <laughs> are you going to bring the dogs? I don't know, Susie. Are we allowed to bring the dogs? You're allowed to bring the dogs. <laughs> oh, you know, you can't, get by the way, the, you can't get them into Hawaii. It's a, it, they'll quarantine oh, really? them. Oh. They'll quarantine them. Yeah. The fee oh. I'm paying to take the dogs to Canada here in next month. It was oh, is it time. outrageous? Oh my God. Insane. Really? <laughs> Insane. James, how is your dog? Your dog had a little little mishap. She's awesome. Um, uh yeah, the mishap. So you guys had to kind of got this in real time text message, but for the listeners, um, I'm we we wake up. Oh, look at that! <laughs> oh my God, how cute! <laughs> For the listeners, I have an an old English bulldog, which is a you know it's the um, the breed they're fixing it where they they breed them with with um, American bulldogs and mastiffs, and she's a lot she's longer and taller. She's much healthier. She doesn't have the breathing problems or the hip or any any of that problem. So, but she likes to eat everything. I mean, she like has a voracious appetite. And so, um, which matters because we wake up one morning, I let her out of her crate and, uh, and she kind of trots out. Well, actually we were asleep and we could hear her whimper in her crate. She's on the other side of the room. We hear her whimper and we're like, what was that? And then she just kind of like banged against the crate and went back to bed. I'm like, well, that was kind of weird. Maybe she had a bad dream. She dreams. And so anyways, whatever, we didn't, we didn't think much of it. Next morning, let her out. She trots out outside. She goes to the bathroom about 15 or 20 minutes later, she comes back inside and she's sitting next to me, next to my desk. And she's looking up at me, like there's something wrong. And I'm looking down, like, is everything okay? She's just looking at me and she's like, something's wrong. And then she just starts to shake and oh, she's like man. shaking and going to convulsions. And she's like on the floor, like going into convulsions. Like, what is going on? Ugh. I call, I call my wife. I'm like, what is going on? She comes in and we, we try to try to get her to drink water, whatever. I'm on the you know phone with Susie and trying to figure out like what could possibly we, cause it's now it's like six o'clock in the morning. There's no vets open. There's not. So we're like, really? what the hell? So, um, and she's like, you know, Susie, said sounds like she's going to anaphylactic shock and i was like it's exactly what it looks like like she got like stung by bees or something like something happened but there's no welts nothing on her 
We bring her to the, the luckily there's an emergency room here, the 24 hour emergency room. We bring her, we get her in there. She walks right in and it's this, this, you know, they've got this large marble floor with all the operating tables and everything. Like it's a, it's like a brand new full facility here. And so for dogs. And so she walks right in and vomits all the water all over the floor. And we're like, this is just not like, this is not normal. And so they do every single test they can on her. They do a sonogram, they do x-rays, they like they've done, they, they, they have inspected her head to toe, nothing, 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 nothing. And they're like, the only thing that showed up was swelling in her stomach. And she's like, you guys are probably feeding her too much human food. And we're like, we don't feed her human food. We give her, Your you know, fault, James. she's farmer's fresh. And so we're like, she gets better food than us, you know, like it's good. <laughs> so anyway, we're like, the, and she is... Yes, she does have the history of eating some things she shouldn't eat, but she had just been outside. Vicky watched her the whole time. She came back in. It was like there was nothing. She didn't eat anything. And so she's like, well, something is really irritating. Like her stomach lining is swelled and she's she's like having problems breathing. Like there's some. Well, we finally figured out, OK, they're doing construction next door um, and a ton of construction in their yard. And we have a lot of scorpions here and we have seen, been seeing scorpions in the house. And so um, we figured out that it was, she either ate, she ate either a scorpion in her, in her crate, which is why she banged against a crate, whatever. Cause she didn't get stung by it. She probably ate it and swallowed it whole and it stung her in the stomach is what we think. It was either that or a vinegaroon. And if you ever, if you ever seen one of those, Oh, it's like, it's literally the, the hell hell's bug on earth. It's, it's a mix between a giant spider and a scorpion. It is, it is the nastiest creature you've ever oh, seen. I just Googled it. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> it's nasty. Cool. So we've seen those around too. So anyways, <laughs> so, space. She, we're about, we're about, we're if about you're 90, watching this on YouTube, I'll put it on the full screen. Oh, it is Lord. brutal, but we're about 98% sure she swallowed a scorpion hole and it stung her. Oh. Because then she was fine. It was like nothing. Uh, Thank God yeah. she's okay, though. I mean, that could have been. I feel like some yeah, of that could have I mean, been venomous. Or no, the scorpions here, they're like they're kind of like a wasp spite, a wasp, um, you know, sting. It's like um, they're called wood scorpions, and they'll oh. they'll get you, and they'll it'll swell up your your muscle will shake. For I mean, I've been stung by them a bunch of times. It's it's not that big of a deal, but for a dog, <laughs> swallowing it. Being stung in the stomach, probably not that great. So, or in the throat or something. It was just so. Yeah. That thing, that She's thing's good. bigger than my dog. I have a little mini sausage dog that would have ate it. Oh, the, the vinegar <laughs> They're nasty. They're like the size of your hand. Ugh. Yeah, not oh, really. Holly would not have been able to swallow that. It would have swallowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Wait, Preston. So you're bringing the dogs to Canada to Jeff's? Yeah. Yeah. They have big I, got, I got permission from Jeff when we were in uh, <laughs> Bedford. You got to be I, careful, I, I Preston. They're them. huge scorpions in Canada. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. <laughs> and Preston, is bourbon on your diet? Because my husband is literally packing like a, a luggage between he Sam better. and you. <laughs> <laughs> he better. That's awesome. So that's yes, ma'am. PPT is allowing bourbon in your diet. Oh, you know what? Zero carbs if it's on ice. <laughs> it's on ice. Zero <laughs> carbs. <laughs> You guys, this has been so much fun. I, I love Always. spending time with you, even if it's virtual. I wish we lived. I wish we were just all next door neighbors. How fun would that be? That'd be that amazing. Would be fun. Um, but great to see you. I'll share all your info in the show notes. And we're going to we're going to be able to hang out very soon. Bitcoin National, Yay. right? At least Yay. Then, and some others, yeah. some other events. Um, so thank you, guys. I, I, I hope yeah. you guys have a great rest of your week. Happy Father's Day weekend. And yeah, happy Father's Day, guys. Miss you all. Awesome. See you soon. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. If you're listening on the Fountain app, you can show your support and share your thoughts by sending a boost. Last month's top episode was with Michael Saylor at Michael E. Sparks, boosted 777 sats and said, we're still early. Another popular episode was with Ed Dowd at Justin Affronti, boosted 500 sats and said, Paul Ryan actively talking about US CBDCs and some folks think it won't happen in our lifetime gradually, then suddenly. Great job, Natalie and Ed. Thanks so much, Justin. I love reading and replying to your boost. So download Fountain on iOS or Android today and make 
make sure you're subscribed to Coin Stories. This show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. Just reach out at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.